Good morning, Ministers, and uh, welcome to the Transport Select Committee. Um, as you know, we're focusing on cycling safety this morning. Um, we called for a Twitter campaign on this, and in fact, we received 775 tweets. And the questions that we're asking are, are focused around the issues that are identified there. And in some cases, we may ask you the direct questions in, in the tweets themselves. Um, perhaps I could start by asking you, um, who is the Minister for Cycling? <laughs> I'm the Minister for Cycling, uh, and my colleague and here... I'm the Minister for Road Safety. There you are. <laughs> so who is in charge in terms of, of safe Cy cycling? Cycling policy is my colleague. And the Secretary of State, of course, is in charge. <laughs> right, so neither, <laughs> so neither of you, <laughs> Secretary of State, you both have responsibilities. Um, what, what powers do you have to raise the, or what plans do you have to raise the, the profile and the leadership in relation to cycling safety? This has been one of the key issues raised with us. And I'm asking that to both of you. I don't know well, which you of you feel that you're yeah. the ones that should be replying to that. Well, I mean, first of all, I think the profile of cycling generally has been increasing in, in recent years in a way that is very helpful. It's been increased, for example, through the Barclays bike hire scheme in London, through the provision of the super cycle highways, um, cycle super highways, uh, also by the um, Where We Welcome Times campaign. So I think the, the, the profile of cycling generally is, is higher than it was. That's something which I've been very keen to encourage. Uh, I held an event, uh, for example, with TfL uh, in uh, just last month, uh, in which I invited local authorities from around the country to come and look at good practice uh, and to have the opportunity to, to exchange uh, views, and, uh, and that was very well received by local councils. Uh, we have to recognise that uh, the, the provision of, of cycling infrastructure and encouragement for cycling uh, of course, it's partly a role for government, but it's good to be delivered on the ground, but not by the Department for Transport, but by local councils up and down the country. And therefore, if we're going to make real progress with, with cycling, which I want to do, then we have to make sure that local councils are fully engaged. Um, one, of, one of the questions we received um, was, how is the government directly supporting the Times Cycle Safe campaign manifesto? Um, are you engaged in any of the issues in that manifesto? There are eight points there covering yeah. quite wide areas. Uh, well, we are engaged, and, and, and I think you'll have seen the fantastic out, uh, turnout to the uh, adjournment debate, which uh, Julian Huppert, the member for Cambridge, called in Westminster Hall, where I think 77 MPs in total spoke at that debate. And in, on that occasion, um, I went through uh, the eight points of the Times campaign and indicated what we were doing on each one. As it happened, uh, we'd already made quite a lot of progress on some of the, some of the points the Times had raised uh, before, the, uh, before the Times campaign began, uh, which uh, I hope indicates to you and the committee that we're already there, but uh, we're not simply responding reactively to what the Times has done, although we very much welcome the campaign they've initiated. And where there weren't points which um, uh, had been addressed beforehand, we've sought to do so. Um, my colleague and I wrote on the 28th of February to uh, the leaders and chief executives of each council um, across England um, in response to uh, the campaign. We indicated what we were doing as a department and what we thought that they could help us with as well. Um, and, uh, for example, I've encouraged as part of the um, response to the Times campaign each local council to consider whether they should have somebody in the organisation who would take a lead role on cycling, a uh, cycling commissioner, a champion, whatever they want to call it, um, who could help drive these matters forward at local level. So I think on each of the points we have actually responded. I think um, as well as um, supporting many points that the Times campaign and others uh, supporting cycling are doing, um, it is fair to say that one of the disincentives for cycling is that if the public perception is cycling isn't safe. And cycling is safe, it's a very safe way of transport. But that if we're not careful, and it has to be a balance, uh, that we make sure that, yes, we address the issues, for instance, some of the issues in the Times campaign, uh, uh, but at the same time, encourage people to not just to continue to cycle, but to take up cycling where they haven't perhaps done it before. Thank you. Uh, Mr Maynard. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that you've just been asked focused on how the government has responded to the Times cycling campaign. And I've tried to drill down one level lower. Has any budget or money been reallocated 
as a consequence of the time cycling campaign? Well, we have found, because of the prudent management of the Department's finances, we were able to find £50 million recently, um, £8 million to which I allocated to Sustrans to help provide off-road infrastructure. Um, they've already got lots of schemes which they've got worked up and we're able to bring those forward and, and, and deliver some of those earlier. I've also allocated £7 million extra to the Cycle Rail Working Group, uh, which is designed to help end-to-end -end journeys and provide extra cycle provision at railway stations to try to ensure that people uh, access uh, the train station and take the train and, and have a, therefore a, a, an entire sustainable journey rather than taking a car all the way, so that's been provided. In addition to that, of course, the local sustainable transport fund is ongoing. There's £560 million, uh, as you'll know, in that particular fund, which is a, a, a greater amount than all the various pots that the previous government had uh, for sustainable transport. 39 projects uh, already, or 39 allocations of money so far from that, totaling £155 million. On of those 39 schemes, 38 have got cycling elements. So we're actually, in a, in a, in a, in a direct sense, not only encouraging cycling through the, the terms of reference for that particular fund, but we're also seeing councils now responding very helpfully and sensibly to that particular fund and coming up with cycle elements for their local sustainable transport fund bids, and they are now being delivered up and down the country. A number of the Twitter questioners have focused upon uh, the practice in France, and I believe the Netherlands, whereby the motorist is presumed to be at fault in any accident mm. involving a cyclist. Has any study been conducted by the DFT on that model? Do you know? Do you want to do that? I'll try to do that. Um, it has been looked at before. I'm not saying there's a physical study. And the legislation within those two countries you've alluded to is different to ours. And um, we've always uh, steered away from the presumed guilt in, in, in this country. So it's something we, have, we are looking at and we have looked at, but it isn't something at the moment that we are looking to uh, proceed with. But that's very much a justice um, department mm -hmm. question with all due respect uh, mm -hmm. rather than a transport question. As we've just been hearing from our previous panel, there appears to be two broad philosophical camps in terms of improving the safety of cycling. One focusing on trying to improve the behaviour of all road, road users, whether on two legs, two wheels or four wheels. Another on trying to design the danger out of the system. And just this morning we have seen in the Times how there is a strong correlation between a particular type of large roundabout dating from the 60s and very high casualty <coughs> rates. Do both of you, as ministers, have any view on whether the emphasis of government policy should be on trying to change behaviour or trying to design risk out of the system in the first place? Um, if, if I do the behaviour part, because that's very much around my portfolio, it has to be, and I'm sure Norman will agree with this, it has to be both. You, you, we, you know, everybody has the right to use the highway, but we have to make sure we use it safely for them as well as others. Um, the infrastructure, which is predominantly in Norman's uh, uh, um, portfolio, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about, but it has to be both. We, it's, it's an educational process as well, which is vital if we are going to make sure that everybody enjoys the road, whether on two wheels, powered or non-powered, human or, or motorcycles, uh, the, the trucks and the infrastructure that keep the country going and keep our growth going or you know, the, the, the person who just uses their car on a Sunday or just cycles on a Sunday. They have, we have to do that cross across to make sure we, we train them much better. Um, but as to the road infrastructure, um, I'll pass on Norman in a second, but the, um, in the, the highways, Asia, we are conscious, and it's some of the things that I was quite conscious about, in that the, there isn't full connectivity. So that was even on part of the, the, my infrastructure, um, and we'll take the motorways out of it, but on the, the trunk roads, you, you have cycle facilities that kind of stop and then don't start again. And that is something we were looking at before uh, the Times campaign. The Times campaign have picked that up, and we, it's something we're working on now to actually address where they are. And I, I, I think I have the money actually within the budget um, to actually address that as well. On the infrastructure point, I think there is a problem going back decades in this country, to be honest with you, where there has not been either an understanding or consideration given to the needs of cyclists by successive county engineers, or whatever they were called, up and down the country at different local authorities. And we had a mindset, particularly in the 1970s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, where roads were designed for motorists and everybody else had to be pushed out of the way. Pedestrians were shoved underneath the, the road and underpasses. Uh, cyclists were encouraged not to cycle there. And, and you, know, you get places like Hyde Park Corner, where it's almost impossible to 
get across the road other than in a motor vehicle. So that's the inheritance that we've got to deal with. And now we want to get people cycling, we have to deal with those points or encourage local councils in most cases to deal with those points because uh, they are not user friendly. Even recent in additions on, on um, road infrastructure haven't always considered cycling properly. I've seen traffic calming schemes, including in my own constituency as a matter of fact, where in order to slow the vehicles down there's been, there's been cobbles created mm -hmm. or, or pinch points created. And actually, the cobbles mean that cyclists can't actually sensibly cycle over the, the, the road surface that's been put in place. The pinch points mean they're pushed out in, into the, the path of the vehicle uh, instead of having a little channel where the cycling, cyclists could go down beside the pinch point. So those sorts of design problems, I think, uh, are, are, have been endemic, to be honest, in the country. And you can't suddenly change all that overnight. I think what we can do is to try to, from the Department of Transport's point of view, uh, encourage local councils, as we are doing, to take account of the needs of cyclists in the way they design their road infrastructure and where there's a particular problem at the moment in terms of uh, any, uh, any points where accidents uh, occur on a frequent basis, uh, to try to look at what can be done to retrofit those particular points, to try to make those junctions or roundabouts safer for cyclists. Will that come in specific guidance? I'm sorry? Will that come out in specific guidance? To local well, we, we have got guidance already, but we're, we're certainly happy to look again at, at what we're saying to local councils in terms of uh, best practice and, and how they can best design their, their road infrastructure to take account of cyclists. I'm very happy to, to engage, as I am doing, with local councils to try to make sure that the best knowledge that we've got is imparted to them and, indeed, the experience they've got is passed back to us. Mr Sturdy. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. A number of tweets came in on, um, on infrastructure, which uh, Mr. Baker, you've, you've um, be already, already touched on, and the, um, and the need to have more engagement with, with local authorities and, and with new projects, and why um, isn't, uh, aren't cyclists taken into consideration when planning new projects. And also, um, a number of tweets came in on the investment side in, in segregated cycle lanes, which was talked about a lot in the previous debate. Now, if Sweden heavily invested in segregated cycle lanes, I think about eight years ago, and it was seen to cut um, cycle deaths by 50%. Um, Do you both think that the government should invest more in, in, cycle, in dedicated segregated cycle lanes? And I know you talked about eight million going to, going to Sustrans, but I mean, I mean, I'm talking a lot more of bigger sums than that, because let's be honest, that, that is potentially just a drop in the ocean. Um, and if, if the government should invest more, which is coming through on, on, on the tweets, then obviously that would have to come as a consequence. So if, it should, if you think it should invest more, at what, what would be the, where, where would it come from? Well, there's a number of different answers to, to that question. I think, first of all, um, I mentioned the historical legacy which we've got, and that's because I think councils up and down the country, or whatever persuasion, have not regarded cycling as important, which is why I think part of the answer is to have somebody quite senior at local level, cycling commissioner, whatever you want to call them, uh, a cycling champion, to ensure that the, uh, a, a council, a local authority, does take these matters properly into account rather than being an add-on. There are plenty of very good cycling officers up and down the country who actually have no power and are very low in the organisation and they know what they're doing but they don't have any clout to get things delivered. So that needs to be sorted out. Um, in, in terms of the uh, in infrastructure uh, investment, I've mentioned the infrastructure we're providing, uh, the, the money we're providing centrally towards local councils and otherwise, but there is a tension, as you'll appreciate, uh, in, in uh, central government seeking to intervene and direct too much at a local level. Well, we're not in a position to do that, when as a government we're trying to get away from, from, from that arrangement whereby we micromanage everything from the centre. The, you know, the local highway authorities are the people who are best placed to ensure that the cycling provision is properly delivered locally. Uh, we can give help, we can give guidance, uh, we can point them in the right direction, but ultimately, you know, if there's a particular junction problem in Kettering or Devizes, it's a local council down there that has to sort it out, not with, us. With, with that in mind, if I may, Madam, Madam Chair, with, with that in mind, um, could you see scope for, and this was talked about in the last session and, and um, was part of the Times Manifesto, scope for investment in segregated cycle lanes from private sector businesses? And if so, could they be incentives put in place 
from government and potentially local government, maybe over business rates, etc., for those sort of investments and sponsorship <coughs> within dedicated cycle lanes? Well, I, I personally think we need to get cleverer about securing money for investments in infrastructure generally. Uh, the Times campaign uh, referred to the idea of, of uh, rolling out or encouraging the sort of Barclays bike hire scheme which we've got in London. And I think this example in London is, is demonstrates how, with a bit of ingenuity from the local authority, you can actually attract business to provide some of the infrastructure uh, you there want. Is a, if, I can, if I can butt in there, Minister, there is a, there is a fear, though, that that, this, that that works well in London and, and has been a success, and sponsorship in potentially in cycle, dedicated cycle ends could really work well in London. But how do we get that into, into our northern cities? And should there be something given from government, and as I say, maybe through local government on business rates, to actually try and incentivise that? Well, I don't think that London is necessarily as different from the rest of the country as you, as you think it is. There's a huge population in Manchester and Liverpool and Birmingham in our great <coughs> cities. Uh, and as we're moving towards an era where we give more responsibility to these great cities, as, as I think we should do, then I think they'll step up to the mark. There are, there are many ways in which you can get in extra infrastructure other than through directly providing through the public purse. There are, there's planning gain, of course, as part of any, any major investment process which takes place from a planning application. And rather than simply saying as planning gain, we'll have a, a, a kid's playground, which happens to be the off, often the, the, the default position of a local planning authority, why don't they say, mm -hmm. you're creating a, a big employment centre which we welcome in this particular part of your city. Uh, here is where the employment is likely to be. We'll have a dedicated cycleway, please, as part, of the, as part of the planning gain from that particular application. And indeed, if you look at some of the, the schemes that we're funding from the local sustainable transport fund, they are directly to help create growth in cut carbon by linking up places of employment with places where people uh, tend to stay. So I think local councils need to be sometimes a bit smarter than they have been at identifying potential sources of income to help move this agenda along. Thank you. Leach. Are there any plans to improve driver awareness, um, attitudes and behaviour around cyclists? Yes, um, and it, as, I, uh, as the committee knows, I've got an ongoing work with the driving test, which we are changing on a regular basis. And we are not only at that level, at the new drivers, but the Think campaign is also, we're doing a lot of work on that, and the Think brand works very well. Um, I'm actually looking at what TfL have done in London. There's some of the advertising in London, or billboard advertising, I think is exceptionally good. So I'm not going to intend to go and pay a lot of money for someone else to come up with the same idea, and I'm going to poach it. And we're going to run some of that out around the country through the Think campaign. I think the, there's a particular issue around the interaction between cyclists and HGVs or cyclists and buses, for instance. Has any consideration been given to have a compulsory element of uh, large vehicle training, uh, forcing people out on, onto bikes so that they can actually appreciate um, how a cyclist has to interact yeah. with Not the Not so we can HGV. force people out onto bikes, but I, I know exactly what you mean. And that is uh, the, the, uh, some of the trade associations are already doing that voluntarily, and we're starting to get that through. Um, there is um, uh, some issues, particularly in London, we've had some terrible, terrible, sad situations with, but with uh, tipper lorries in London, where people have been killed uh, with, on cyclists with a tipper lorry turning left. There's an investigation and, and, uh, into that at the moment. I intend to extend that around the country, because TfL are doing that at the moment, into buses, because we don't particularly have a problem with buses uh, and cyclists here in London, but we do in our, our, some of other parts of the, the country as well. The, the, we, we've heard some examples this morning about certain companies taking a very proactive yes. approach to this with their, with their drivers. Um, but I've also given the example of writing to bus companies in Manchester suggesting um, a constituent's request that they mm. should send their bus, uh, trainee bus drivers out on the roads mm. to appreciate how, how cyclists feel next to large vehicles. And the response was, well, it's too dangerous to do that. Surely, um, if, we, if there's no level of compulsion, a lot of, of organisations and companies just simply aren't going to do it. Yeah, I, I understand exactly what you mean. Um, interestingly enough, you know, 18 months ago, didn't, there was no drivers going out there on these schemes, so the companies weren't involved that you heard of this morning. And I think that, we will, that will increase as we go forward. Um, if there are bus companies that have written back in such a negative way, and, and my colleague is the Minister for the Bus Operators, they have a responsibility as well. But 
you know, we mustn't take the responsibility away from whether they've been on a, a cycle or not. As a driver of a PSV or a HGV, you have a responsibility to make sure you drive that safely for all road users. And if they're not doing that, then they, they need to be, make sure that their training is incorporated. Does the government revert, um, have the option, though, in the future to uh, have some level of compulsion if companies aren't going to apply? Um, the, the government, in, 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 in the end of the day, could legislate however we want, but we are a deregulation government. I think it would be very difficult, I'll be honest, I'm always honest to this, but I think it would be very difficult to make it compulsory for all PSV or HGV drivers to go on a push bike and learn what it's like. I think that would be, for some of them, medically not, probably not possible as well. But you know, we, at the end of the day, we, we, we must make sure we don't take the responsibility away from the driver of that vehicle to make sure they drive that safely. There's no excuse whether you've been on a bike or not as to whether or, whether or not you drive safely. That's your responsibility. Uh, Mr. Carlton. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm not getting a, a very clear idea, and it's probably my fault, of what your goals are for this area, if you like. I mean, how do you judge your success in particular with regard to cycling by the end of this parliament? I mean, do you want more people cycling? Uh, what are your uh, uh, targets with regard to cycle safety on the roads? Um, could you just give a, some think, more I impression about that? Very simply, yes, we want more and more people of all ages to cycle, and the, the, the figures are there to see how successful uh, that, that is becoming, more and more people cycling. And then I measure that against, sadly, killed and serious injury, injuries per head of the population. So, for instance, my colleague earlier on was alluding to um, Sweden. Um, Sweden um, has 0.22 per 100,000 uh, population killed. We have, at the present time, um, have 0.17. So without the, the, the schemes that the Sweden has, in, we, are, we are already not the top, and anybody that's killed is a, is a loss, but we, we do very well, considering how many people cycle uh, on a regular basis. That figure needs to come down, and the other figure needs to go up. But the more people you get to cycle, the more people you will. And, and sorry, by logic, have you, have you got anything? On that? Well, I mean, to, 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 to reinforce the point Mike was making, um, the average number of people killed between 1994 and 1998 was 186 in terms of cyclists. It's now 111, and 111 too many. But I mean, it, it is broadly going in the right direction. And we, and in terms of the number of people cycling. We do want more people cycling for all sorts of reasons, for health reasons. There are 50,000 people die each year from coronary heart disease. Um, so not cycling is far more dan dangerous to your health than cycling is. Um, the risk of dying from not cycling and walking is the risk of obesity and all the other health problems that occur, which is one of the reasons why I've been working with Anne Mills in the Department of Health to try and make sure that we're joined up across departments. It's also the case to get more people cycling, uh, and I can't prove this, but this is anecdotally what I observe, as has happened in London, then that, that modifies driver behaviour from car drivers. Car drivers are more tolerant, I think, of cyclists when there are more of them around than when they are an oddity on, 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 on the streets. You don't see very many of them. And just as a follow-up on that, do you see um, significant amounts of extra spending as a way of p achieving the goals that you've, you've outlined? Uh, I've been very keen to encourage local councils, not just through the local sustainable transport fund, but through the integrated transport block money they have as well, to, to think about cycling, because cycling is good for the environment, it cuts carbon emissions, it's good for public health in terms of uh, the individual's benefits from that, and it's actually good for the, for the driver of the motor vehicle who's still in his or her car, because there are fewer people on, on, in their cars and that eases congestion. So always it's good. It's also good for the economy, and the Department of Transport uh, had some had some evidence to suggest that people who turn up in a, in a town centre on foot or on bike actually spend more money than those who turn up in, in the cars. I find that quite counterintuitive, but that's what the figures tend to suggest. And certainly when I was uh, on holiday last year in, 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 uh, in Bavaria, uh, these towns which I went to see, which have, had no cars in them, uh, uh, no cars, They're, everybody was on foot or on bicycle, they were packed out. Every single shop was, was busy, they were selling lots of stuff, the economy was booming in these places and it was without cars being there. So there's an economic benefit, I think, as well to, to cycling. So for all those reasons, we're very keen as a government to support cycling, uh, but it has to be delivered ultimately on, on the ground by local authorities rather than by DFT. We can give a lead, but we can't, we can't micromanage what happens in town centres. I think there's one, one extra point that uh, has to be If you are building something or re uh, um, or from scratch, there is no real extra cost in actually building into, no. into it that you are going to make sure that cyclists and pedestrians and everyone 
are in it. It's, what, it's the adaption, as was alluded to earlier on, from the really old networks, um, which becomes the really difficult thing because we don't have the money you know, to go out and rip everything out. I mean, I have more people knocking at my door asking for new road programs than I ever knew I had that many friends. You know, it is, but we only have a limited uh, amount of money. And, and, but when we do adapt, especially when in my network, one of the things which I'm very conscious of is that we must make sure it, 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 the connectivity is there. But there, there shouldn't be any extra cost if you start from scratch. And I think a classic example of that, in many ways, you know, is Cambridge. And going back to what Norman was saying, you know, my, my daughter has spent the last three years up in Cambridge. As a driver, it's a nightmare. She cycled everywhere. And, and you won't find a busier town centre on a Saturday than Cambridge, I'm sure. But the strategic framework very consciously doesn't have targets. So how are you going to be able to tell if you've made cycling safety? Well, these figures will. You have a cycle safety. If, you're going to, if you've made cycling safer and you've done as much as well, you've done, you've no government. target that no, you're no, aiming I, for, how are you going to we, judge I think we discussed this in other areas um, uh, on my portfolio. The government as a whole is not a, a fan of targets simply, and I've explained this before, because if you have a target, the easy bits get done first and the hard things don't necessarily get done. The reason we will know is how many people cycle, that, where that increase comes, and whether the figures killed per head of population continue to drop in the way we're you don't need a target to prove that, it's, it, it would be there. But if you've not got a, a target that says what would be a reasonable reduction in a given period of time, how will you know if you make any reasonable is, progress? Because any death is or death too many. So how, how can you have a target on how many people you want to kill? I, 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 that's my view. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think targets are superficially attractive, but, but can actually produce perverse consequences. I mean, for example, um, any sensible target on the number of reduction in the number of deaths on cyclists would have to take into account the number of cyclists out there and the number of miles which they cycle because that's actually the relationship that counts is, is, is the deaths per 100,000 miles or whatever we want to describe it. That's quite difficult to, to tie down. As Mike rightly says, if you end up just getting to that figure, then you sit back on your laurels and satisfied and think we don't have to go any further. Actually, we want to go as far as we possibly can. So I think it's, 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 it's better in a way to to try to do the right things and not then have a target which you then meet and stop, but actually to try and continue forward. I mean, I want to get more people cycling. I don't want to quantify how many people that is, not because I don't want a target for it, it's going to be difficult to meet or something, but because I just think it's, 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 it's an abstract which doesn't help uh, to do that. I want more people having bikeability training, more children in particular. I want more, more children but, but cycling But you don't want to, to have any figures of what you should be aiming for in a I, I think time scale. I, I don't think it necessarily helps. Chairman, I, re I really don't. That's, that's why I'm, I'm reluctant to have targets for that, those sorts of things. Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you. Our previous panel of uh, witnesses uh, highlighted the need for de cross-departmental working uh, on this issue, and Mr Baker, you've already indicated you work with uh, Department for Health. Um, I'd like to just ask about how you work with uh, CLG uh, on urban planning issues. Uh, it was suggested, uh, for example, that uh, provision for cyclists should be as formal a part of a, a planning process as, uh, I think I'm right in saying, fire service has to be consulted uh, for access for, for their emergency vehicles. I was wondering on that specific one and more generally uh, how you see working with CLG. Well, the working to, of government, uh, as, as Tom Harris and others will know, involves, involves um, departments uh, having to consult other departments when they want to introduce new policies and certainly there's been uh, engagement with all the departments uh, in terms of the new planning framework which CLG has brought forward. The Department for Transport has clearly been involved in that process and we make our views uh, very, very clear on that and uh, I think as a consequence of government working uh, reasonably harmoniously I think across, across departments, uh, you know, our points are taken on board and that's, that's the way um, we work. So uh, I think the, the mechanisms of government do ensure that you don't have one department doing something which then has an, an unwanted consequence for another department and we do have an, a process for engaging actively on that. As well as that formal process there are all sorts of other processes. I mean I've mentioned already uh, discussions I've had with Ann Milton at the Department of Health. They're quite important. The Department of Health is, is, is represented on the cycle uh, forum, which I've, like a stakeholder forum which I set up last September. Uh, they've actually got a place on there deliberately to make sure that they're plugged into that. 
I have meetings with Tim Lawton, for example, the children's minister, about children cycling to school and how they get to school. So we do have these connections, and we try to make them work, you know, recognising each department has got its responsibilities, but also recognising that, that no department should have a silo mentality. But specifically on the point that uh, cycling provision should formally be part of the planning process, is that something you've got a view on? Well, I, I'm not sure we've made that specific point. I have to check and come back to you. What we have done is, is to uh, uh, make sure our COD colleagues are aware of our commitment to sustainable travel. I, don't, I think they're aware of it and they support it, but we made them aware of our commitment to sustainable travel. And they need to ensure that there's proper provision in the planning regime to take account of that. Thank you. Mr Harris. Do you both cycle? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, you'll be pleased to know, as a former transport minister, that uh, when I was offered a ministerial car on day one, I refused it and said I would have a ministerial bike uh, in order to get me to the Commons to vote because it's 10 minutes walk, I think, from, from the DFT headquarters and, it's, uh, and uh, it's eight minutes for the division bell. So I've now got a, a Brompton which I use to get across, a departmental Brompton to get across from the department to, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the House of Commons. And uh, others, I know Theresa Villiers, for example, is a keen cyclist as well. So. Uh, and indeed, the Prime Minister's I been there. I think events have rather changed their mind on that. No, she hasn't changed her mind on that, I'm happy to tell you. Uh, and the Prime Minister and others are, are keen cyclists as well. So this, this, is, this is a culture change. Look, when I was first elected as a member of Parliament in 1997, um, one of the first things I did was attend a county council meeting uh, or a county council establishment for a meeting. And I arrived by bike. And, and when I arrived by bike, there was a parking space allocated for me with a bollard in the middle and a sign saying Member of Parliament. And there was nowhere to put my bike. So I wheeled my bike into the reception area uh, because there was nowhere else to put it. Uh, and the receptionist looked at me in horror and said, you can't bring that bike in here. We're expecting a member of parliament. Uh, and that <laughs> demonstrates the mindset which there is about cycling. You know, cycling is not a second class activity. It's not something done by, by people who've got no other alternative. Cycling is now a choice which many people of all strands of society now want to embrace. And that's very good. So you'll find plenty of cyclists in the House of Commons, you'll find plenty of cyclists in the ministerial teams up and down uh, different departments, and that's how it should be. Mr Penny. I, I do. Um, sadly, or not sadly, I, I, um, it's in the garage more often than it's out, okay. which I get, and I'm honest about that, I get nagged to death by my daughters about it. Uh, anybody that's had students at university will tell you that they cycle everywhere because it's the cheapest and the best way to do it. Um, However, do I get out as much as I'd like? No, because I'd rather be out on my trial very often. I, I, I wasn't asking uh, in order to, to give no, no. you an opportunity to, to say how great you are because you use a bike rather than a car. <laughs> There's a very practical reason. When you're cycling in London, Mr Baker, do you go through red lights? No, I mean, I, think it's, I don't go through red lights. And I think it's very important that cyclists respect the law. And I think, uh, you know, we must, have, we must have traffic rules which apply to all road users, whether they're car drivers, bus drivers, cyclists, pedestrians, whatever, that we all respect and that's, that's the way we do should go forward. So I condemn people who don't, uh, don't obey traffic signals. But do you accept some of the arguments that are made by some of the cycling organisations that there may be uh, uh, an argument, a safety argument, that for some cyclists going through a red light makes them safer from a possible collision from behind? No, I, 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 I think it may also make pedestrians yeah. less safe because many of our traffic light arrangements uh, in London and elsewhere have got pedestrian phases and a pedestrian relies on the red light for the traffic to tell them it's safe to cross the road. And if you have cyclists coming around the corner and pedestrians are crossing, that's not a safe uh, arrangement. Where I do think it's worth looking at <coughs> are arrangements where we have cycles placed at the front and we've got that increasing at junctions where there's a space for cyclists so they can get ahead of the vehicles and leave first. The vehicle can see them, that's very good. You can also have an arrangement whereby uh, you have, and I, I know TFL is looking at this, I think at the Bow Roundabout, Mike might know this more than I do, an arrangement where you have a segregated cycle arrangement where cyclists are allowed to go first in a different light. So those sorts of arrangements I think are safe and recognise potential safety problems for cyclists. But I think allowing them to compromise a red light would not be the right way forward. Which brings me on to... As the road, as the road safety minister, um, I share with you, we've not discussed this, interestingly enough, but my, my job is to protect everybody, including pedestrians. I think a red light is a red light. Sure. Um, and if any colleagues or the committee would like to, if you go out in front of carriage gates at that crossing just by there where you go across to Westminster um, uh, Abbey, uh, you will see 
sadly, people jump in the lights. But you should, especially this time of year, the sheer amount of pedestrians trying to get across it, even when they shouldn't be yeah. doing it. Frankly, there's just we have a law in this country, and it's for a reason. It's because it's safer if you don't go through a red light. Our earlier witnesses uh, made the point that since traffic lights were introduced in the 1930s, they haven't really evolved in any shape or form at all. Um, is the government considering any change to traffic lights, uh, for example, allowing cyclists or other uh, drivers to turn left at a red light, for example, as this have in some states in America? Yeah. Or are we beholden to the, the, the status quo in terms of, of, the, of the how traffic lights work? I think we we keep ever that no minister is going to sit here and say we're never going to look at that again. We have a, one of the issues about turning left on a, on, on a red light frankly for me is cyclists um, mm. and you know if you allow a cyclist to turn left on the red light and the motorist in, you know and the bow flyover incident was which so sadly a gentleman died I've met his, his widow and family and they've been brilliant as to how that campaign has worked was because a tip lorry turned left on the red light I can't say much more than that because there's a police investigation going on if we start allowing one the others will think well I've got the right to do that and then that's, it's, it's a very difficult I, I accept you know where, where we are on this. I think what we must make sure is people that are sitting at traffic lights are safe. And one of the ways to make them safe is to put them in front of the traffic. However, I've also seen a situation where the motorcyclists who also like to be at the front of the queue at the traffic lights, and you've got this disparity in speed away and, and things like that. But I, I, I am, we will keep them an open mind. Um, and you're right that one of the, the, the traffic lights haven't dramatically changed. But one of the reasons they haven't dramatically changed is they do what it says on the tin. They actually do their job. Yeah. Just one last question. Mr Baker, have you done your bikeability badges? I haven't done my, I did my cycle proficiency. I'm too old to do bikeability. I did cycle proficiency. Ah, no, no, no. When I was the minister, I did all three oh, well, bikeability well, badges. Then so I... you should do it as well. I stand chastened. I have been out to, um, to participate in bikeability, but I haven't done the, the badges. Thanks. Um, in our previous session, um, Mr Snow, I thought, made a fairly unfair comment um, that the vast majority of people wouldn't know who the cycling minister was. Uh, now, I, I think most people in this room would recognise that uh, Mr Baker has been a fairly active and prominent cycling minister, but I think it shows an attitude that most people don't recognise the importance of cycling uh, and, and who the key players are. Um, how do we raise the profile more um, so that your position as cycling minister is very key in people's minds? Well, I think if you ask anybody who the minister of anything is, you're unlikely to get a response that tells you who they are. I mean, uh, probably, probably some people think Churchill is, a, is a, some, a dog that sells insurance. I'm afraid we got to that stage. So, I mean, I'm not confident that we, that we can ever get to a stage where the cycling minister or the road city minister or the education minister or anyone else is, is known as a, a, as a public figure. What I, that, in a sense, that's not important. What's important is that there's a mindset change uh, throughout the country about the value of cycling, uh, particularly in local authorities, about how they approach cycling. And uh, that's much more important than concentrating on one individual. We are promoting, for example, the summer of cycling. We've allocated some, some, some help towards that from the department. Um, and obviously, with the Olympics coming up this year, there's a big opportunity to, to reinforce both sport, um, healthy activities, and cycling in particular. So we'll be working with DCMS as we are doing to try to make sure that happens. You, you advocated having a local person with a responsibility for cycling within local authorities. How senior should that person be? Well, I think it should be someone, uh, pers that's up to local authorities obviously, but personally I think it needs to be someone who's got some, some clout. I mean, they are the delivery agents for cycling infrastructure in this country. There's a bit in the highways agency, but frankly, most of it's done at local authority level. So I would like to see someone reasonably senior in, in, in the transport team in each local authority personally to, to be able to do that. Either someone who's a senior officer or, or a lead member in, in, uh, in, 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 in their cabinets. But I don't think it's for me to specify that. But it needs to be someone who is able to command the support of the local authority. And when they come forward with an idea, um, they're able to enact it rather than simply having it filed away somewhere. Uh, Mr. Baker, you say um, whoever is responsible in local authority should have some clout. Do, do you have enough clout to influence things like planning policies, um, regulations for cycle lanes, allocation of funding for cycle lanes, and, and matters of that sort? 
Well, I've got, I've got, I think I've, I think I do all right in, the, in government terms, uh, both within the department, and it's not difficult in the department because I've got, I've got three colleagues um, in terms of Secretary of State, Mike here and Theresa, who are supportive of cycling, and therefore it's an open door. I'm pushing an open door to get stuff done on cycling, and uh, when there's been um, spare cash identified through our prudent financial management of the department's finances, uh, that's been made available on occasions for cycling, so there's no resistance to, to, to that agenda. Uh, as far as cross-government cross is concerned, I've referred already to some of the links there are with other departments. I've also engaged, for example, on the, with the Treasury on the Cycle to Work Scheme, and they've been helpful on that. So I think there is, the, I, don't, I don't detect resistance particularly, either from inside the department or from elsewhere in government, to promoting the cycling agenda. Has any money been specifically allocated for cycle lanes? Well, cycle lanes, I mean, uh, Michael mentioned whether the highways agency has, has done that, um, but in terms of cycle lanes for local authorities, we wouldn't get into doing that. In, in the same way, we haven't allocated money for, um, you know, bollards. I mean, we just don't get involved in allocating at that micro level. We, we, we allocate a transport block to local authorities, which they're able to spend as they see fit for their transport priorities. Uh, I've supplemented that on occasions through either the local sustainable transport fund or the specific allocations to groups like SUSTRANS. Uh, but you know, we wouldn't ever get involved in allocating to that, to that level, I don't think. I, mean, I, I think our job is to try to get the right culture at local council to help that evolve, rather than to start specifying to the nth degree in that way. Are any changes being considered for heavy goods vehicles? in, um, for example, compulsory sensors, uh, additional mirrors that will allow them to see cyclists in their blind spots and things of that nature? Yeah, um, but the tricks and mirrors are probably, which are fixed mirrors at, at Travel Lights, we, we trialled in London um, and are now available to local authorities that don't need permission from the central government, which they used to have to do. Um, we've signed the, uh, the, the regulation on the legislation to do that and they can do that. We are leading, this is a very much, I said at the last uh, evidence session, I think, is we are leading uh, in Europe on the mirrors in particular. Um, there was a meeting at uh, the Commission only last week where we've moved to the next stage. It's like watching paint dry, but it's happening so we can get the, uh, for new lorries, they have to have uh, much better uh, mirrors. I'm still told that's probably going to be in the 13, 14 before that legislation comes through. And we're in a, it's not just about the UK. I mean, we have to do this within a European construct. The sheer amount of overseas lorries on our roads will tell us that. The census is much more difficult. We are looking at that. We've asked uh, the Commission as well. We are um, going to have some research done. But the, the difficulty with sensors, which are basically, for, for those that don't know, they're like reversing sensors but on the side of the vehicle. Um, and they will pick up literally anything that's on the side of the lorry. So if you, you know, yes, if you're a cyclist, it could well pick you up there. If, you, if you're a bollard, if you're a lamppost, if you're a post box or a pedestrian, it will pick it up. And as I said, I've said before, what really worries me, and I was trying to emphasize this at the moment, we must not take the responsibility away from the driver to do what the driver should be doing, which is observing around his vehicle. If it, if it looks like it would work, okay. some companies have, have, have looked at this and, and it hasn't worked for them, but we will do this through the European channels like we are doing with the mirrors. And, come to a consensus on it. But I, there is a degree of scepticism as to whether it will do what it says on the tin. In other words, the, the sensors will go off quite a lot, which means they won't look, which means they won't look in the mirrors, which actually is a negative and we'll have more problems than we had before. And can we learn anything on safe cycling from countries such as the Netherlands and Denmark? Well, I'm always happy to, to look for um, lessons from elsewhere. I think we, we, we should be uh, always open to, to that, and I've been over to look at cycling uh, in, uh, in uh, Holland uh, in particular, which is very well known for that. Uh, I think my colleague Mike earlier on referred to the, uh, the, the rate per 100,000 of the population in terms of, in terms of cycle deaths, and we actually come above the Netherlands. Uh, we've so got a better record on that. Um, so uh, what we can learn from the Netherlands, in my view, is probably not safety issues particularly. Uh, what we can learn from the Netherlands is how to uh, encourage people to cycle more, uh, to improve the infrastructure, the public infrastructure, the public realm, to join up different modes of transport like, like uh, rail and cycle. That's what we can learn from the Netherlands rather than safety. I mean, I went to, I think it's Leiden Station, and I think I'm right in saying that when I got to Leiden Station, medium-sized town, there's something like 13,000 bicycles parked there every day, um, and no cars, or hardly any cars. Um, we're never going to get to that situation, but we can make a lot more progress on that. So they're the lessons we can learn, I think, rather than necessarily safety lessons.
I think it's a classic example as you, as you massively increase, quite rightly, the amount of people that cycle, your figures for deaths actually work. So, for instance, on the European table I have here, uh, the Netherlands is fourth from the bottom um, with 0.84 uh, per 100,000 population, where we are actually, I think, seventh with 0.17. And that is not because they don't care about cycle safety, that is because there are so many people cycling in the Netherlands, and you will get those ratios going up. I think the Netherlands may want to come to see us to see how we are making sure that so few people are killed in cycling terms as we increase the numbers of people cycling, because the figures would indicate that we can perhaps do it a bit better than they are. Thank you indeed. Any further questions? Numbers? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.